Okay, so uh, this is your chance to ask me about uh, revision of metric and topological spaces. Does anyone have any questions from the exams? Yes? About the, uh, the year 2004 and 2005. Yes, 2004 to 5, yes. Question 5. Question 5. Yes. This is which one? The... Okay, so, so this is 2004 to 5. It's question 5, and we're looking at part D. And is Y with the subspace metric, the infinity to order, complete? So here, x is c of naught 1 with the uniform metric d infinity. And y is those functions in x so that 2 is less than to f of x Let's go to 3 for all x in naught 1. And presumably you looked at the solution? Okay. So the solution presumably says it's complete because it's closed and because x with d infinity is a complete metric space. So let's just summarize that. <coughs> Solution says that uh, x d infinity is a complete metric space, that's standard. And that Y is a closed subset. <coughs> and then so, by standard theory, Y with the subspace metric d infinity tilde is complete. So that's how the solution goes in the big picture. So the question is. Um, which one? How to prove that Y is closed. Okay. So, what you have, you can, you can do it in various different ways. So, first of all, what is the definition of closed in a metric? In a metric? Okay, so that's a topological definition of closed, is that the complement is open. And you can work with that. But there is also an equivalent definition of closed using sequences. And what is the sequence criterion for closeness? Yeah. That's right. So if you want to use the sequence criterion, and I think that's slightly easier here, though you can do it either way. Um, perhaps the sequence criterion is the easiest. Which solution did I go for in the solutions, or did I say it was obviously closed? No, hmm? I did it with the open, did I? OK, so let me give you the sequence version, um, because perhaps that's slightly easier. So you suppose you've got a sequence of functions in Y, 
and that they converge in X to something uniformly. So let's see why Y is closed in X. Using the sequence criterion. So what we do is we let Fn, because they're functions, be a sequence in Y and suppose Suppose that Fn tends to something, tends to some function f in x, and of course that's in x to infinity, and then tends to infinity. That's for some continuous function f in x, right? Then we have to prove that f is in y. So we have to use the information we're given. So since fn are in y, for all natural numbers n, we have that uh, for all x in, um, are we working on 0, 1? I think so. And all n in the natural numbers, just using the fact that we're in y, what is it? 2 less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to 3. 2 less than or equal to fn of x is less than or equal to 3. Now, fn tends to f uniformly. So that implies that fn tends to f pointwise. That's a one-way implication. Uniform convergence implies pointwise convergence, but not the other way around. And that's all we need to get this. Um, let's. give a name to this con condition star. If you let n tend to infinity in star, we'll get exactly what we want. You get 2 less root of f of x is less root of 3. That's true for all x in 0, 1, and so f is in y. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions about that uh, proof? Well, so you can you can do it the uh, the other way with the open set version and so on. Well, I think that one's quite this one's quite clean. Matter of taste, really. Any uh, more questions from these past papers? Yes. Oh, I see. So you, you get uh, that you can make a pseudometric in a sort of standard way by um, working with real valued functions and look at the difference, yes? yes. Can you prove that? Also? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a very important standard result and, and it comes in all over the place, yes? Oh, yes, okay, yes. Yes. 
Well, d infinity gives you uniform convergence because it's the uniform metric. Okay. So yeah. So that's a little a, a little additional comment. Remember, d infinity. Um, you, you know the d infinity metric. Um, gives the topology of uniform convergence on, on, on C of naught 1. So, uniform convergence is stronger than pointwise convergence. So all I was noting was that we knew Fn tended to F uniformly because they converge using d infinity. And because they converge uniformly, they also converge pointwise. And it turned out that pointwise was enough. Um, enough in order to prove that, that you still stayed in Y. You know, you could do a, um, you could do a, a different set where pointwise convergence might not have been enough. You know, in general, generally, things that are uniformly closed don't have to be pointwise closed. But this particular one happened to be both. It's uniform. This particular set Y is closed under uniform limits and under pointwise limits, whereas uh, other, other things might not be. Yes. So there's one point which is outside. And then we knew that the distance between this point to, to the limit Q or the limit Q is bigger than zero. Absolutely, that's right. So, and you can do that again. I, so you can use that for the epsilon one. So, so uh, for the audio recording, uh, as, which doesn't always pick up questions from the audience, let me point out. Um, so the question is here can you do a version of this which is approved by contradiction? Suppose you've got a sequence of functions fn in y that are converging to a point, to a function f that's outside y. Notice that function is not in y, and therefore there must be some place x where it takes a value that isn't between 2 and 3. Then that means that uh, the value that it takes will be at some positive distance to the interval 2, 3. And then any other function that is uniformly close to that purported function can't possibly be in Y, and that'll give you a contradiction. That's absolutely fine. Um, I, I somehow have, in my taste, I don't use proof by contradiction unless I have to, most of the time. Um, it doesn't really matter, but, but I, li I, li I pref have a slight preference for direct proofs. Uh, one, the very, there, are, there are some mathematicians out there who don't accept proof by contradiction. Um, it's, not, it's not universally accepted, and there are some, some mathematicians who can't prove as many things. And so it's quite nice to have a proof that doesn't use contradiction because then that proof is available to more people. But uh, that, that's uh, the only real reason. Okay, sorry. So to return to your question, you have a question about pseudometrics and uh, the standard construction. And this is something where you can take any set and take any real valued function on it and make a pseudometric out of it. In fact, it's actually even more general than that. You can take any set and any function taking values in a pseudometric space and you can make a, a new pseudometric out of it. But I'll do the real valued one just so you see how that one works. Um, and this is relevant to what I said last time about transferring metrics around as well. So. Uh, so this fits in with some of the stuff I had in the, uh, the lecture about homeomorphisms between the real numbers and the open unit interval and how to transfer a metric between the two spaces. So this is uh, using functions. Uh, that doesn't look right. Using functions... to uh, generate pseudometrics. So I won't do this in the most general form. 
where the most general form would be where you took a function from a set X taking values in a pseudometric space and used that to give you a pseudometric. I'll do a real valued function defined on a set X and we'll see how that one works. So let X be a set. It doesn't need to have any metric on yet. And let F be any function from X to R. And we'll define... What should we call it? Let me call it row sub f from x. Uh, x cross x goes to r plus. x cross x is not great, is it? Um, let me try that again. Let me have some bigger x's and some smaller x's. So we'll have big X cross big X. Goes to R plus. So the row F distance from X to Y is the modulus of F of X minus F of Y. Or the other way around. And we've got to check the pseudometric axioms. Well, so we'll let x, y, and z be in the set x. First of all, we've got uh, what I call axiom 1 prime, which is the distance from x to itself is the modulus of f of x minus f of x, which is 0. That's a good start. Notice you don't get the metric axiom because um, it's possible the function f takes the same value at two different places. If the function f takes the same value at two different places, then you'll get two different points at distance zero apart. That's why you only expect to get a pseudometric. But if the function f is one to one, and you're going into the real line or into a metric space, then you get a metric out of it. Uh, two, symmetry is completely easy. Um, row f of x, y... That's a modulus of f of x minus f of y is equal to the modulus of f of y minus f of x by a symmetry of modulus. Uh, which is the rho f distance from y to x. And finally... The row f distance from x to z, which is the modulus of f of x minus f of z, someone remind me what you do to, to finish this one off? It's supposed to be less or equal to the row f distance of x to y plus the row f distance from y to z. So how would I rewrite this? Yeah? Oh, uh, your turn. Yeah, just Exactly. So I'll rewrite that, the modulus of f of x minus f of y plus f of y minus f of z. So we've added zero, as you say. Um, now I use the triangle law for modulus, uh, that, so it's less than or equal to the following. So that's by the triangle law or triangle inequality for modulus. And uh, am I missing one line? No, I'm not. Um, that's equal to, again, the row of distance from x to y plus the row of distance from y to z. And we're finished. Okay. And as I said, you could have the function f going into any metric space, 
and it still works. And then you get a metric if and only if the function f is one to one. But if your function f is going to a pseudometric space, you still get a pseudometric, but you don't know it, the function f being one to one might not save you. Because if you're going into a pseudometric space, then you might have two places you're going to that are different where the distance is zero apart. So a few little things to be careful about there. But generally speaking, this is a very easy and useful construction, and it will it comes into a, to quite a few things. Does that does that make all make sense? Okay. I didn't realize it was that simple. Okay, well, so <laughs> okay, but still one or two things to think about. Is the, the main thing to think about with that, it is really dead simple, but the main thing to think about is when do you get a metric out of it and when don't you? Um, and what if you're going into a pseudometric space? What if you're going into a metric space? That sort of thing. Okay, any... Uh, more questions about metric and topological spaces? Nothing? Were you happy with the... Uh, so you, you asked me about the why being closed, but were you happy with that question 5D about the question of whether Y was sequentially compact? Did I also, I want to ask you about that one. Yes, okay, because that's the harder part. I think the, the, com the completeness was the easier part. So that was 5D part 1 was whether Y was complete. So returning to Y and X... from uh, 2004 to 5, exam question 5. The claim is that Y is not sequentially compact. And actually, this is well worth thinking about because it's going to be relevant to some of the stuff we're going to do in this module. Imagine I'd said that it was functions that took values between minus 1 and 1 inclusive. That wouldn't have been very different. If I'd said it was functions between minus 1 and 1 inclusive, that would have been the closed unit ball in... Uh, what you can regard of uh, as, you know, this uh, Banach space, this complete norm space. Um, so there's not much difference between Y and a closed unit ball, um, except that I've translated it around a bit and scaled it. So, so the real question is, apart from the fact that there's a proof in the solutions, what is going on here? Um, so for the moment, forget sequential compactness and think of compactness. And, it, and you have... In finite dimensional spaces, you have the heine borel theorem, which tells you that, that compact is the same as closed and bounded. Well, this set Y is definitely closed and bounded. So why isn't it compact? And the answer is it's because you're living in an infinite dimensional space instead. And uh, there's a rather remarkable thing, turns up. Um, the closed unit ball in an infinite dimensional Banach space can never be compact. Um, and we'll prove that in the module functional analysis. So it's one of the things we'll prove. can never be compact. Um, and it can never be sequentially compact, which is the same for metric spaces. So we could go through this particular special case and have a look at the argument given in the solutions here. And that would be OK. But actually, there's a much more general phenomenon coming on here, which we will see in the module. And that is that the closed unit ball, and this isn't very different from that, in an infinite dimensional Banach space can never be compact. Actually, infinite dimensional norm space, I think you can say. I, I didn't think about that, but uh, I think it'll be even less, even less compact in an infinite dimensional norm space. But uh, perhaps I need to, to think about that a bit more. Uh, we'll see a proof of that. It, it uses something called Reese's geometric lemma that says if you've got any. Um, infinite dimensional norm space, you can find a sequence of vectors in it with norm 1 
whose distances are very close to one apart um, from each other. And once you've got that, then no, subse then no subsequence can converge to anything, and you've had it. You can't quite get them distance exactly one apart, but you can get them very, very close to distance one apart. Certainly, you can have the distance, all of them distance more than a half apart. So if you can find lots of functions which are distance a long way apart, um, you'll be home, because no subsequence of them can converge. And actually, that might be another way to think about this question here. Um, can anyone think of a way of finding some functions in Y which are, all of them, quite a long way apart from each other? So, y, so in Y, so Y, we remember, is those f in C of naught 1, so that, what is it, 2 less root to f of x is less than equal to 3 for all x in naught 1. Now, if you want two functions to be quite a long way apart, one thing you could do is arrange for one of the functions to be 0, where the other one is a decent distance away from 0. Um, sorry, here we can't do that. So what we could do here is we could arrange for one of the functions, uh, these functions taking values between 2 and 3, we could arrange for one of the functions to be 2, where another function is quite a long way away from 2. And you can do that, say, using spikes. So let's see, 1, 2, 3. This is not to scale. I want to imagine that you've got two different functions, and both of them are going to spend most of their time being two. And one of them will go along and be two for a bit. Oh, I've got it wrong again. Gosh. They'll spend most of the time being two. So one of them will go along at two for a bit, and then go up here maybe and come down here and that's a nice continuous function and the next one might do something similar except it'll go along a bit further and then maybe go up like this now there's an example of two functions in the set y continuous you can figure out what sort of definitions to give them and obviously, their distance one apart uniformly. Does that, bit, does that make sense, though I haven't written down explicit definition? Can you see that if you had two functions like that, they would be uniform distance one apart? Now, so how can you arrange for a sequence of these, all of them looking a bit like this, and none of them having spikes in the same place? Any suggestions? Where could you... Say this was the nth function. Yeah. And that'd be absolutely fine. So, uh, so then we can go say between uh, two to the minus n and two to the minus n plus one. If you do that, then the bottoms, the bottoms of the spike will touch, but that doesn't make any difference. Okay? And so you could define... I'll leave it as an exercise for you to figure out the exact definitions of these functions. But you could arrange... for the functions... Uh, for some functions... Functions fn in y such that fn of x is equal to 2 if x is not in the closed interval from 2 to the minus n plus 1 
up to 2 to the minus n, but that fn still has a spike taking you up to 3. So fn of um, an is equal to 3 for some an in obviously the open interval. Uh, optional notation for open intervals that um, if you see, if I accidentally write backwards square brackets uh, um, rather than round brackets, I mean the same thing. And if you do that, so it's an exercise to uh, give some explicit definitions for these. You've got a lot of choice there, but there are some natural choices, some natural candidates you could choose. Then the d-infinity distance from fm to fn is equal to 1 for all m and n in the natural numbers with m not equal to n, of course. And that prevents any subsequence of converging, because if you had a subsequence of converged, then after a while, the elements of those subsequence would be pretty close to each other. So no subsequence, not only just no subsequence converge in Y, no subsequence could even converge in X. Um, which, of course, since Y was closed, was going to be the same anyway. So no subsequence of Fn can converge since... Um, If, say, fnk tended to f, then uh, fnk and, say, fnk plus 1 would have to be close. For large k which would be a contradiction. Did that, uh, did that argument make sense? Any questions about that argument? No, is that OK? And that's the kind of argument we'll use in this module along with this thing called Reese's geometric lemma, to prove that um, the closed unit ball in an infinite dimensional norm space, if I remember correctly, is never, is never compact, never sequentially compact, and so never compact. Any more questions about that or about anything else on metric and topological spaces? Yes? Um, yes? Uh, question number two, in the same year, 2004 to 5, yes? F. So a metric on minus 1, 1, which is equivalent to the usual metric, but so that R with its usual metric is isometric to minus 1, 1 with this new metric. This is very good because it fits exactly with um, one of the early questions we had. And it fits in with the transferring metrics across, exactly. So this is, this is perfect, because this fits exactly with, with one of the things I was talking about in the earlier module. So this is, again, 2004 to 5, two-part F. It's given example...
of a metric d prime on the opening of a minus one one. Is this the right? Is this the one? Is this the one you want? Yes. 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 Uh, a metric d prime on the opening interval minus one one, which is equivalent to the usual metric. On minus one one, but so that R with its usual metric is isometric to minus one one with this new metric. Okay, so my first question here is, um, I'm, I'm let, why don't you give me two different reasons, at least two different reasons, why you can't use the just use d prime to be the usual metric of minus one one. So, obviously, if you use d, if you took d prime to be the usual metric on the open interval minus one one, then obviously that would be exactly the same as the original metric. So how do you know immediately, without even thinking about it, that that isn't going to be a metric space that's isometric to R with its usual metric? Because remember, to check that two spaces are not isometric, it's not enough to say that the usual map you'd think of isn't an isometry. You have to know that there isn't any map that gives you an isometry. So you have to pick out some... So, so to be sure that didn't work, you'd have to know some feature of the metric space or features which distinguishes them as metric spaces. So let's see what's wrong. So who can tell me what's wrong with the usual metric of minus 1, 1? It's bounded, exactly. Being bounded is a metric space condition. The real line is not bounded with its usual metric, and minus 1, 1 is bounded with its usual metric. So you know that that's going to be no good. So whatever this new metric you're going to use, or minus 1, 1 is, it had better be unbounded, okay, um, to have any chance. Now, what I suggest is that you transfer the metric from the real line across using a homeomorphism between minus 1, 1 and the real line. And that's probably what the question says, uh, probably what the solution says. Uh, but there are lots of different homeomorphisms between minus 1 and 1. So what you should do is you should find a homeomorphism f from minus 1, 1 to r, and then use the, the metric rho f, as we talked about earlier in this session. When you do that, f becomes the isometric uh, map, okay, then this always happens, M is an isometry, minus 1, 1 with rho f goes to R with the usual metric. So all you have to do really is find a homeomorphism and then explain why this, thing, this whole thing works in terms of standard theory. So what's your favourite homeomorphism between minus 1, 1 and the real line? Tangent. Tangent, OK. So, so for example, you can take f of x is equal to tangent of, what do you have to do? You can't just take tan x because it won't quite work. Yeah, tan of pi by 2x, yes. So the pi by 2 scales you up to give you between minus pi by 2 and pi by 2, and then tangent works nicely. But you know, there are loads of others around. So, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there are lots of different functions that do, do the right thing. Um, so it, it's sort of obvious, standard, whatever. This is continuous, you know... 
Uh, you can write down a formula for its inverse, which is to do with arc tan, which is also known to be continuous, and so on. So then you get a homeomorphism. Then you've got this bit about rho f, and the fact that you end up being isometric. And then the last bit is why is this new metric equivalent to the old one? Now, I guess we're almost out of time, but which of those issues would you want to think about? The, the equivalence to the old metric, or the isometry, or, or is it now all clear? Hmm? The equivalent. The equivalent. So why is it equivalent to the old one? OK, so there, what you need to know is there's lots of different equivalent definitions of equivalent. <laughs> um, so what... So for you, what does it really mean to say that uh, two metrics on a set are equivalent? How do you think of that? With the same limit, yeah. Okay, so that's a perfectly good definition. Does anyone else know some other definitions of equivalent for metric that would be the s equivalent? The, the, the same, uh, same topology, that's the same again, okay. And uh, how about any more? Can anyone remember another one? In terms of the identity map? Suppose you've got, so given x with metrics d and d prime, you can consider the identity map id x from x to x. It's not a very exciting map. id x of x is x. So why would anybody look at that? Well, because if you put two different metrics on x, you can ask, about this map. So we can consider the identity map that, but look at identity map on x as a map from x with d1 to x with d2. Then d1 and d2 equivalent if and only if this is a homeomorphism. So that's if and only if this map idx is a homeomorphism. So your task now is to go back and look at the setting that you're in there and see why the identity map is a homeomorphism. And what you do is you have an isometry going from naught minus 1, 1 to the reals, and then a continuous map coming back. You compose them and you get a continuous map one way. And the inverse is the other way. You have a, uh, the other way around, you've got a continuous map going to the real line and an isometry coming back. And you compose them and you get another continuous map. And so you can see it's continuous both ways. Does that make sense? You need to fill in some details. If you have any more questions about that, let me know. This idx, the identity map. I'm not sure whether everyone uses the same notation, but everybody has a notion of the identity map on a set, um, that maps a set to itself. Yeah, that's, fairly, that's fairly common. But maybe not everybody uses the same notation. I think some people use i, but that can be confused with the identity matrix. Um, which does pretty much the same thing. Um, so I'm using id for identity. I think different people use different notations. OK, we well should stop there for today. If you do have any more questions, please let me know.